Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this week's uh, William W. w. Hay Railroad Seminar. Um, before we get into introductions, a few housekeeping items that we do every seminar. If you have a cell phone, please turn it off or put it on vibrate. Uh, if we have a fire alarm, you can exit from either door and then down the stairs outside across Main Street and we'll assemble uh, next to the Hydro Systems Lab, uh, except if that's on fire as well, and then we'll figure out where to go. Uh, use the buddy system, look to the person to your, uh, next to you, and look for them outside if we have to go there. Uh, in the event of severe weather, uh, although I don't think we have any tornadoes scheduled for today, uh, we will go in the basement. And the best way is to use the exits, go to Newmark, and then all the way down into the basement. Uh, if you haven't swiped in for your pizza, uh, please be sure to sign the attendance sheet that we're passing around, include your name and affiliation. And if you did not receive a direct email announcement, uh, make sure you put your email address uh, so we can get you included on future mailings. <clears throat> I would like to also welcome those that are participating uh, online today. Uh, we have representatives from Alfred Banesh Company, Geocom, Michigan Tech, um, not sure what the spelling of that is. Um, Railstone or Railstone Engineering, uh, Knife River, IDOT, uh, Parsons, and Patrick Engineering. I think that covers most of them. And if I didn't include you, uh, it's because I couldn't read what your name of your company was. <coughs> um, I think we already mentioned, John, if any questions come up, please repeat them before you answer so the people online can hear the question. And then who's here from the ARIMA student chapter? Any announcements? Yeah, Manu. Okay. Happy hour will start at 5 o'clock uh, tonight, and we will also be joined some, with some uh, prospective rail students who are here for the student recruitment weekend, so we would encourage you to come and participate. <clears throat> the William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And so on behalf of us, we'd like to thank the USDOT, who sponsors that program, uh, for their ongoing support. We greatly appreciate it, um, not only for those of us here at, on campus, but those that are participating online. <clears throat> In the railroad industry, um, I can't stress enough the importance of monitoring the condition of the railway infrastructure. Uh, this is particularly important in regards to railway safety, uh, but it's also important uh, to, to better understand and, and manage the economics and the cost of operating and maintaining railroads. Over the course of past several decades, various non-destructive technologies uh, have been developed to do this. Uh, one particular focus has been in technologies that evaluate the condition of concrete cross ties. Uh, recently, some research on new approaches using ultrasonic scanning technology for this evaluation has been developed, and Professor John Popovics will be talking about that in today's seminar. Professor Popovics, uh, came to the University of Illinois at, in January of 2002 and holds the rank of associate Prof professor. He completed his BS and MS degrees in civil engineering at Drexel University and his PhD at Penn State University. He teaches undergraduate and graduate level courses in material science and engineering, construction, material corrosion and durability and concrete technology, wave propagation and non-destructive testing. Uh, his primary interest is in non-destructive evaluation, imaging and sensing, where he applies mechanical and magnetic field phenomena to assess the condition of the infrastructure, uh, materials, and structures. Uh, his research findings have been published in four chapters and books, 60 articles in technical journals, and 85 conference proceedings. He received the NSF Career Award in 1999 and ASNT Fellowship in 2012 and has received numerous teaching and advising awards from the University of Illinois. 
Uh, lastly, he's been named Fellow of the American Concrete Institute and the American Society for Non-Destructive Testing. So with that, please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Professor John Popovics, who will present uh, the William Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar titled Non-Destructive In-Place Condition Assessment Technologies for Deterioration in Railroad Ties. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, Conrad. I appreciate the um, kind introduction. Also, the opportunity to come talk at one of these Hay Seminars. I've seen them going on for quite a while, and it was nice to be invited to participate so I can share what we do. Is this microphone loud enough on for the online people? We'll hope, hope so. So um, <clears throat> today I'll share some uh, of the work that I've been doing here at the University of Illinois along with my research group, my graduate students, who I should acknowledge now because really they're the ones who uh, are doing all of the hard work and uh, coming up with ideas and solving problems, and some of them are here in the front row. And uh, so I appreciate their contribution. They acknowledge it. So as uh, Conrad mentioned, that this kind of effort for non-destructive evaluation, interrogation of railroad infrastructure has been going on for quite a while and from different people using different approaches. And in this talk, I'm not going to summarize others' approaches and what others have done, and not to diminish their work, but I'm going to focus on just what we have done here at Illinois using our approach, which is a kind of a scanning ultrasound approach. And I think this cartoon kind of nicely um, encapsulates what we do. We send in energy to a material, in this case, uh, railroad tie. We let that energy interact with the object, in this case the tie. We listen to the response, and based on this response, now we have to come up with some scheme or some way to determine something about that tie. The thing that I'd like to point out is that we are doing this without touching the tie. This is offset from the surface of the tie, and that's offset from the surface of the tie. And if you think about the um, miles and miles and miles of rail infrastructure that owners and operators are concerned about, that means we have to have a way to inspect these without holding up the operation of that rail line. And uh, that's a big job um, if we have to go and manually inspect and physically contact. So our approach is, can we do this without touching? Can we do this from a moving platform? And I'll show some images to kind of convey uh, the concept. We're not there yet. We're working towards that, but that's the idea. So in this talk, I'll give a little bit of overview. We have a very diverse audience, both online and in the class, and I have to kind of lay down some basic foundations for some people who will be reviewed, for others that won't, so that we can all understand why we are doing and how we are doing what we do. And then I will talk a little bit about our approach. And we have lots of different approaches to kind of take that information and make sense out of it, kind of invert the data and draw a conclusion. Lots of different approaches. I'll describe a lot of them. Um, these are the ideas that we're going after. And then part of that is kind of building the hardware and the test setup um, to make it happen. This is not technology that you can buy off the shelf. We have developed it. My students have developed it. They deserve the credit. Uh, and so that deserves a mention and a description. And then once we have that as a background, I will go over just a few selected results for one specific kind of case to kind of show how we are attacking it in some more detail uh, before we go on. Um, the future work and kind of wrapping things up here. And by the way, I should say, if you have a question at any time, don't feel like you have to wait un unless, do you have a policy about that? Okay. So if you have a question anytime, don't hesitate to ask and then um, we can deal with the question at the time rather than waiting to the end. Uh, so <clears throat> the part of the structure, the rail structure that we are interested in looking in 
is the tie. So there's been a lot of work on NDE of the rail part. I have not done much of that. Um, there's some very interesting, innovative work on residual stresses and cracks and so on. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, the tie. And uh, this audience knows the importance of the tie, but many lay people may not understand that it's actually a very important role and that's to distribute the loads and provide support and isolate the rails and maintain stability and so on. If the rail is to be stable and continue to carry load and have its capacity over the long term, of course the rail itself has to be kept intact. But the ties also have to do that because they play a large role. And uh, I like this picture, which I got from Riley. Um, uh, because it kind of conveys the problem. Look at all of those ties just in that little um, section of track. There are 100 plus ties. Mm -hmm. And if the operating agency wants to know the condition roughly of all of those ties, that's a big job, even in this small section of track. Now imagine hundreds of miles of track. So this is becoming a big job. And uh, so our vision to do that, which I think is uh, somewhat unique, is that we'd like to do that um, from a moving platform. So here, this is a concept, artist concept. We are not there yet, but I think we're close to try and do this. So from a moving rail platform, you see that the idea that we have a sender and receiver interrogating the ties as it moves along continuously, seamlessly. We don't have to stop. We don't have to uh, touch the tie to get some information. Of it. That's the goal. So the before we even come close to this, we have to solve several problems. One is, how do we configure these to actually get the information in and out in a usable format, covering parts of the tie that we're interested in, and then once we have that information, how do we interpret it to get some meaningful information? So these are the challenges I'm going to focus on uh, today. And I'll show some results for both timber tie and rail tie in the laboratory. These are laboratory tests. But we, to be honest, we have focused much more on concrete rail tie rather than timber tie in terms of monitoring degradation and so on. So um, timber ties, um, ubiquitous in the United States, very effective. Timber is such a fantastic tool for all kinds of engineering applications. Uh, but it does decompose. And so the principal problem with timber is simply the decomposition of this organic material over time. It rots. And uh, when it rots, it softens and it loses its capacity and it does not maintain the stability of the track anymore. And it's a natural process. It's almost unavoidable. You can treat timber and slow down the process. But if you have moisture and oxygen and environment, the process is going to happen. So we can go from nice, rigid, uh, stable uh, structure to one because of the decomposition that affects its microstructure um, that's much more compliant. Now, it's not so easy by eye to tell the difference between those two. Uh, sometimes when it's a severe case, uh, it's clear by visual inspection. But often, one has to kind of probe the wood and see the resistance to it physically, whether it's deteriorated or not. Uh, concrete ties also deteriorate, but not in the same way that timber does, and it manifests that deterioration in a different way. And I'm teaching a class now, right now, on materials degradation. I see some students in mind from the class. So this is kind of what we cover in our class. We'll cover timber later, but we're talking about uh, concrete. And concrete is a composite, large-scale composite material, quite chemically stable and thermally stable, fantastic material. But it does degrade. It has problems like wood when it's exposed to moisture and the environment and oxygen and loads, it will degrade. And for many of these mechanisms, and often these mechanisms are coupled, 
it's not one mechanism by itself, but freezing and thawing action and chemical reactivity of groundwater work together to start deteriorating <laughs> these things or uh, problems with the original aggregates can cause ASR and DEF problems with processing. All of these things can occur in concrete ties. And very often, they manifest themselves as distributed microcracking. So unlike a steel structure, for example, where you may see a fatigue crack, and there's one, and you can eventually see it, hopefully, and monitor it, and you say, that is all the energy, the deformation energy is going into that one crack, and that's what we have to monitor. In concrete, more often than not, we don't have one crack. We have thousands of cracks <coughs> distributed throughout the material, which I tried to show here, uh, depending on the deterioration mechanism. But it's not, it can't be quantified with one number. Oh, this is a crack. It's so long and so deep. No. We have a certain volume of cracking, and it's harder to quantify. And visually, it's hard to see these cracks. I mean, you can think, oh, yeah, I can see cracked concrete. But really, to differentiate between superficial cracking and extensive cracking, especially below the surface, it's very difficult to do. But having, so that's, in terms of concrete deterioration, that is one main focus, is breakdown. So freezing and thawing, delayed etching height formation, which is a mechanism that the concrete um, tie have experienced in the past because of processing. Alkali silica reactivity, also, um, and there are cases of ASR uh, affecting, affecting uh, concrete ties will manifest that way. But there are other mechanisms where a discrete defect could occur. So for example, in pre-stressed tendons in the metal and ties, they can corrode. And when they corrode, they expand. The rust around them expands, and it can push out. And it, ca it can cause a very discrete crack. So now instead of distributed microcracking, we have one flat, discrete crack that maybe runs parallel to the tendons that are corroding. That's called a delamination. So th those kind of cracks can also occur. It's a different kind of mechanism. And uh, we can see those. But then we have yet another kind of mechanism, which is unusual in the world of concrete. And this is kind of an abrasive, explosive uh, kind of failure, and exemplified by rail seat deterioration at the top of the concrete tie between the rail pad and the concrete. Um, and I know we have researchers here that are uh, kind of at the leading edge of uncovering this and discovering how we can prevent it and how it occurs. Uh, but essentially, it's a different kind of mechanism. It's not this like internal massive expansion all over the place that will cause this discrete cracking or localized expansion causing a discrete crack, but rather it's an abrasive kind of hydraulic kind of exposure, which ends up causing a roughening and a sloughing away rather than distributed crack. And so we have all, in the case of concrete, we have a variety of mechanisms that we kind of have to look for. And in our work in concrete ties, we try to consider all of them different tools for different jobs. But let me be clear. I don't think we can come up with one tool that can cover all of these in one shot. That's maybe being a little too ambitious. My goal would be to have a health index, scan along and give a health index, yes or no. And it would be nice if that health index covered all of these. But at the stage we are now, being honest, we could probably develop a health index for microcracks in one region, or a health index for delamination, or a health index for RSD, because the way that we build that information is different for all of these, and I'll try and show that. One day, hopefully, we can do all of these three at once from a moving platform and give a yes or no on a rail tie from a moving platform. That's the dream. So let's see how we're doing with this dream. So, before I um, go into the details of what we do, I want to step back and have a little physics review. We use ultrasound, and ultrasound is nothing but, and you can think of it as an acoustic wave, a sound wave. So my voice traveling through the air to your ears is a sound wave. It propagates, and it's a propagating disturbance of pressure. And 
Um, because it's a mechanically based phenomenon, the molecules are moving, hitting each other, and transferring that load to set up this wave front to propagate along. We can tie the characteristics of this wave propagation to mechanical properties of the material through which it uh, travels. Now, I bring that up because you are probably aware of other NDE phenomena that can interrogate rail structures without touching. And there are some been great advances in these. I'm talking about GPR, ground penetrating radar, for example, where it sends an electromagnetic pulse. You get that information back, and you can infer whether the ballast is scoured or depth of clean fill, or maybe if there's large voiding underneath in the uh, fill and so on. It's a fantastic tool. But we are not using that. Even though that's a wave propagation, that's an electromagnetic wave. It's a radio wave. It has nothing to do with mechanics, mechanical effects. It has everything to do with electrical effects. What it detects is electrical disturbances, magnetic disturbances. And that is fine. But what we're doing is we are characterizing the elastic properties and mass density, the, how the molecules are arranged, really. That's what we're tying to. And for me, that's a better way to attack the problem of finding if something is mechanically compliant or not, or in mechanically good condition. So that's why we use ultrasound. Because based on the properties, we can come up with mechanical properties. So in this case, you can see these, this cartoon this animation shows how the molecules are vibrating back and forth. And by bumping into the neighbors, it's like the wave at a football stadium, right? No one is actually running the fast round, creating the wave of the wave front. We, this person is just sitting in place and moving, but then it accumulates into a wave. So with wave propagation, we're not moving mass through. The molecule stays where it is and oscillates. But what we're sending is a disturbance, and it sets up a wave front. And that wave front has a given speed through which it propagates. And it has a certain wavelength, a spatial identity through which it characterizes itself. So if we were to put on a little sensor here to monitor motion, we would be monitoring the motion of that one molecule. And you see how it kind of oscillates back and forth. So if we plotted that oscillation over time, it would look like kind of a sine wave moving back and forth. And that's exactly what we are doing when we hook up a sensor here and we listen for those vibrations that are coming. We're monitoring just a local motion here and trying to infer from that the wave fronts that are coming, maybe speeds, wavelengths, and so on. And then from that, tie into physical properties. So these compressional waves like this acoustic wave that you're hearing, the particle motion is in the same direction as the wave front that's uh, propagating. But there's also a set of waves which are transverse to that, shear waves. They don't exist in the air or in fluids. They only exist in solid materials, the Earth. Um, and from that, we can, if we now put a sensor here that's sensitive to this kind of motion, or maybe put a vertical sensor there, we get an idea of that oscillation, and then we can draw back shear properties of the material and density. Okay? So these are the fundamental waves. But these are not the waves that we use in our research because these are hard to implement from a moving platform into a solid and draw out. Usually, in order to kind of use these kind of waves, you have to have one sender on one side, you go to the other side, wave path goes through. So you can imagine, here's my sender, here's my receiver, I have to be on the opposite side of it. Well, on a rail tie or a pavement, for example, we normally can only get from the top. So these kind of uh, waves um, pose challenges to us. Now, in other, other infrastructure pieces where I can get on both sides, a bridge pier, a column, then we can image using this. And we have some work on tomography where we try and image defects using that. But in this case, we can't. So what can we do? Well, we can use another wave, which is a combination of P wave and S wave, that is, compressional and shear behavior. And these are called surface waves. 
you send and receive from the same surface, they propagate along the free surface. Those other waves propagate in every direction in media, like my voice. I mean, it's directed in this way, but if you're standing over there, you hear it. It goes in all directions. These stick on the surface, and they only penetrate a certain distance below the surface. They're not very big. They penetrate about a wavelength, remember that spatial characteristic below the surface. So with these waves, <coughs> we're able to characterize the surface, but only to a certain depth. And in the case, the wavelengths that um, we use are on the order of inches. So we are not penetrating very deep below that surface. We have a good idea of what's happening an inch or two below the surface. But if you have a serious problem on the backside, this approach is not going to see it, probably, honestly. Uh, so it's a surface detection system. Um, not ideal, but most deterioration mechanisms in concrete and timber start from the outside in because the bad guys that are causing deterioration, moisture, UV, oxygen, come from the outside in. So if we can characterize the outside, we're still in good shape. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, when we have a very defined plate structure, a thin structure in one dimension, large in another dimension. So think of a thin plate that's large in X and Y, but thin in Z. <clears throat> then we can set up a different set of wave modes, and these are called plate waves or lamb waves. Now, I'm only going to mention this very briefly. It's quite complicated. Lamb waves um, are pertinent in seismology, where you have layered strata and pavements and other kinds of uh, structures that admit those, and they're very well understood, but they're very complicated because there's different families of waves that can generate. Uh, but the point is that in certain situations, we may, and yes, in rail tie, believe it or not, there is a situation where we may have a case like this, and I'll explain it, uh, that now maybe we can use this kind of complicated behavior to help us understand what's going on in the rail tie. So I just wanted to introduce the concept of gui uh, guided waves along the surface or along a plate, because those are the ones we will use. We can attack from the same side and get information about those. OK, how do we do it? Well, it's very simple. We have a sender. Imagine a speaker, like on your phone, sending energy out. We have a speaker here. The difference is that the frequency of this speaker, our ultrasonic transducer, is very high, much higher than the audible range. So the frequencies of audible, humans anyway, is up to about 200 kilohertz, meaning, uh, oh, sorry, 20 kilohertz. That's 20,000 vibrations per second. Your ear and your brain and your neural system can hear up to about that Beyond that frequency, you are not capable of hearing that, although it's there. Kind of like there's UV light all around us, but we can't see it. Our eyes cannot see it, but it's there. Dogs can hear higher frequencies than us. They can hear up to 30 kilohertz. So there are certain sounds dogs can hear and are very irritating to them, but we don't even know are around. Um, so I think like vacuum cleaners put out a lot of like ultrasonic sound and drives dogs crazy. And cats. I found out. So we're sending in wave energy, just like a speaker. Imagine you have a speaker and you're sending sound into it. It interacts with the surface of the material that you want to interrogate. And about 99% of the energy immediately bounces away as an echo. And that's too bad, because it does not give any information, meaningful information, about what we care about. That's the concrete tie, for example. Most of the energy bounces away as a reflection. So <clears throat> if I talk to that wall, you will still hear me, because 99% of the energy is bouncing off the wall this way. When you go from air to solid, very hard to get the energy in. Most wants to bounce out. But a small percentage does go into the solid material. And it propagates, and one component propagates as a surface wave, skimming along the surface. Not penetrating very deep, but skimming along the surface. 
And we have to play some games of the right kind of sensor in at a certain angle, and then we maximize this component. Uh, but we can do it. And then we listen somewhere else and imagine that we have a microphone. So imagine this is a speaker and that's a microphone. And this is just listening for anything that happens. So what happens is as this propagates along the surface, it's disturbing the air. And it sets up a, what's called the leaky wavefront, and that leaks into the air. And so we actually hear it, even though we're not touching it. So if you ever watch, you know, if you're at a dock or at a lake or something, and you see waves interacting, you know, a wake from a motorboat comes and it interacts with the surface of the dock or a seawall or something, you can see that when it interacts, it sets up another wave that kind of bounces back off the seawall or the wavefront. So that's what we're doing. The problem is twofold. One is only a small fraction of this gets in, and only a small fraction of that which got in gets out. Most of it stays in. We're talking about tiny signals that we need to pull out of the noise. And here, we're talking about a noisy environment. Are we, if we really want to envision a moving vehicle on a rail, can you imagine all that acoustic noise that's going on the clanging and wind and people talking. It's a noisy environment. So that's in the air. And remember, most of the energy is bouncing off. This guy hears that. So we have to pull a tiny little meaningful signal out of noise. And that is a huge challenge. But that's a challenge my graduate students have kind of worked very hard to solve. And they've done a great job. And we can do it. And we get good signals out if we know how to set things up how to configure it, and how to process it. It can be done. So here are some examples to show um, some results. And so the first thing I should go back here to explain. So what we're doing here is we're sending in waves with our speaker. And in some distance away, I have a microphone. And in fact, I have a several microphones to see which ones are best. And then I also attach a contact sensor here, an accelerometer or a geophone, something that will very efficiently detect the waves. That's the most efficient way to detect seismic waves and things like that. So I'm going to compare those results here. So here you see all of them are kind of compared here, accelerometer and then three different kinds of microphones. MEMS is a kind of microphone. It's a very sophisticated um, design high sensitivity, high bandwidth, it's a very nice thing. The others are, one's um, kind of an industrial microphone, and the other is a dynamic microphone, like, I might, any, like this thing, except we use one that like rock bands use, the Shure SM58. Bon Jovi uses those, and uh, according to their literature, anyway. And, uh, What's good about those dynamic microphones is they are cheap. You don't need to power them, which is great if you want to have an array. And they're tough, you know, because they have to withstand, like, the who coming into town and having a performance. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, the company said that they guaranteed that my students couldn't break one of those microphones. But you should never challenge a grad student that way. <laughs> <laughs> They'll find a way. So um, here are the results. So remember, what we're doing is imagine we're monitoring the surface for the motion that occurs because a wave is propagating. So we insonify at one point, and then we listen. And it takes time for the wave to come. But then it comes, and then you see the motion of the surface, which looks like an oscillation. The contact accelerometer is the highest and the cleanest and the earliest. And that all makes sense, right? It's a very efficient way. It's physically coupled on the surface. It's going to get all that energy out. Uh, it's designed for that. And it's earlier, uh, for a very simple reason, is in that it is attached to the surface, whereas the microphones are offset a certain distance in air. And it takes time for waves to travel in air. So of course, the microphones are later, coming later. But it's the same signal. So obviously, uh, contact accelerometer is awesome. 
very nice clean signal. And even though we're sending in without touching, we have a really great clean signal. But we're touching on the receiver. The MEMS condenser and dynamic microphone also receive a signal. And we can use those. I, these are all in the same scale, though. So you can't really see the red one, which is a condenser mic, and the MEMS. They're there, but because they're on the same scale, they're so small, they look like noise. But they're there. But look at the MEMS microphone. That is a usable signal. That's not touching. So we use MEMS sensors because they're more sensitive. They get more information out. The red and the green, they actually work. If I blew them up, you could see the signal coming. But then the noise also gets blown up. Higher, lower signal to noise ratio, not so good. But we have a very nice usable signal. That's usable SNR for us, signal noise ratio. But look at the blue signal. All of a sudden, we have this little pulse coming, which is delayed after the uh, accelerometer a little bit because of the air offset. But then we have this huge signal coming. Can anyone guess what that is? This gives me the opportunity to drink water. <laughs> I'm getting parched. Exactly. Right. So what happens is that this is going in, traveling on the surface, and leaking. The waves traveling here are fast, much faster than air. But along later comes that lumbering huge wave, and it's huge, and it ruins everything. So our signal is useful about collecting information from that pie until this guy comes. When it comes, it swamps everything, and it's very hard to extract our meaningful signal. So a little bit of a limitation that we work with is that we have to have a configuration where we maximize this distance to get usable signal, but still get quality signal. But now, if I show you some results um, with, with MEMS, we'll see some benefits of using air coupled. One is consistency. So if I have the sender, and then the accelerometer is a receiver, and I take off that accelerometer and put the back as best I can in the same place. And I try to mount it in exactly the same way, honestly trying to do the best. I will never get the same kind of connection there. It's very sensitive to position and coupling condition. So I repeat this three times, and I get the same kind of phase information and velocity information, but the amplitude information completely variable. I can't rely on amplitude information from contact sensors because it depends too much on how you attach it. And as, as hard as you try to keep it consistent, it's very hard to keep consistent. But with MEMS, we have great consistency because we don't have that coupling problem. You put the sensor there, put it back again in the same place, we get the same signal. It's very consistent. So that opens up a whole new avenue of um, characterization, and that is, can we use the amplitude now? Now that we've gotten rid of this problem, we'll use amplitude to kind of see if we can characterize the material. And I'll show you some results where we use amplitude to do that. We can only do that because it's air coupled. Another benefit of air coupling is that it's insensitive to the surface condition. Uh, if any of you have ever done tests where you have to mount things onto concrete, strain gauge, or some sort of sensor, you know that the surface condition of the concrete is critical. And in real life, not all concrete is smooth and polished and clean. It's dirty, rough, and cracked. And in those cases, it's very hard to attach a surface-mounted sensor. In some cases, you can't. It's just too far gone unless you grind it down. So that's another energy and time investment that is not helpful. But air-coupled sensors don't really care about the cleanliness of the surface or whether it's rough and undulating. We can still get energy in. So here we have three different surfaces. Here's an idealized, smooth, clean surface. Here's a moderately rough surface. And here's a very rough, undulating surface. In this one, it would be very hard to mount an ultrasonic transducer or sensor on there without grinding down and getting good surface coupling. But we're able to get quality signals throughout because it's air coupled. So there are advantages. We don't have to pre-treat the material in any way, at least that we've seen yet. I'm sure there will be cases where it's just too crazy to even apply with air coupled. But. OK, so that was a little bit of intro. 
how do we now take those signals and make sense of them? Well, the simplest way is to just measure how long it takes for them to travel from A to B on the surface and get their velocity, their speed. Because as I mentioned that earlier slide, the speed is tied to mechanical properties, stiff, strong, resilient materials carry waves faster. Porous, cracked, compliant materials carry waves slower. It all has to do with the atomic bonding and the interaction between molecules. It's very straightforward. Dense materials typically. So the easiest, one of the easiest things to do is just measure the speed at which it travels across. And so um, I'll show you some results now that kind of show how we can kind of characterize that. So now that we have a system where we have a sender and a receiver at some distance apart, we can send and receive, and because they're not touching, we can move them, kind of synchronize together, and get a, get a series of rays of information parallel to each other and stack them. So we get some information about that. Um, so we scan and we just continuously collecting data. So imagine that's a real time. We're going across and we're co continuously collecting. The speed at which we collect is very fast. It's on the order of electronic processes, much faster than the motion that we could ever get with the scanner, physically moving it. So that's not a problem. So for each one of these lines, let's say we get a signal like this, right? But if we get a lot of signals, a lot of data, and this is what we're talking about, collecting tons of data, what do you do with it? Well, one way is to create an image. So if we now convert this single line to a new scale, let's say instead of having positive and negative values, we give the positive values a bright color and the negative values a dark color. So now we just transform that to a line of color. And then we stack parallel lines together, then we get immediately an image. And in the ultrasonics community, they call this kind of stacked time scans, where it's converted to color or grayscale or something. They're called B scans. It's an outdated term. It means brightness, brightness scan. So it's usually conveyed in terms of brightness. But immediately, we see a lot more information that as users, as an engineer, can kind of interpret what's going on. So First of all, the wavefront is here. We see the arrival time. And if we know the distance through which it propagated, we know its speed. But also, we see interesting features here in terms of its amplitude, its brightness. So immediately we say, hey, this area has a lot higher amplitude than this area. What does it mean? Well, we don't know yet, but it's not due to the coupling condition. It's not an experimental variation. That's due to the material because we already know the air-coupled sensors work very well and very consistently. So now a new world of information has opened up to us. We can measure the velocity, but we can also now glean some local amplitude information and try and get something out of that. So um, that's what we tried to do, and that's like, can we somehow use these forward propagating waves? So we send here and listen here. It, propagates along the rail tie, we pick it up, and we know, let's see if we can use this kind of amplitude information uh, for use. And we found that it's possible to do that, um, and that if we do all the right processes, we can differentiate between different levels of distributed damage in a material. So 0% means concrete with no damage in it, and 6% means higher internal volume of um, defects, simulate the fracture. So we can see these kind of lines of increasing attenuation. So more damage means more attenuation, lower amplitudes, because the damage is kind of absorbing some of that energy. And we can see that graphically here, too. But it's also pretty clear that there's not great distinction between those two all those three damage cases. So what we found is that we can use the forward propagating velocity and the forward propagating attenuation, and we can, if we're very careful, uh, we can find some information about that and use it to 
distinguish cracking. But it maybe is not as sensitive as we would like. And so you've come up with a different approach, which I won't talk about uh, so much detail because we're still developing. It's kind of a new area of research for us. Um, but so I will talk more about these forward propagating uh, waves. So how do we characterize the amplitude? So we can do these plots and get a color, but it would be nice to quantify them. So one thing we can do is somehow get a quantity of that, the amplitude, the energy of the signal. Now, this is the acoustic wave that's coming. It's kind of not useful for us. This is the wave we, we want to characterize. So we could just measure the peak amplitude here at one point and say, oh, it's so many volts, and that's its energy. But rather, we found a better way to capture all of the energy in a more consistent way is we basically just have a moving window. And then we move along, and we kind of integrate that signal and see how much area is under that uh, curve. So we move along, and as we move along, we see this kind of energy content. And we see these kind of curves. Um, and this is an approach that was done in other fields to characterize um, these kind of diffuse waves. And so they use this kind of diffusion approach to interpret this, basically fit a curve to this part, and then you get a diffusion coefficient. It's not really a diffusion coefficient in terms of a materials diffusion coefficient, but because they use diffuse data. So you get this curve, and then you quantify it with a number, and it tells you how much energy is in that signal. All right? And so the idea is that if you have more damage, that, ener that propagating energy is absorbed, scattered away by the damage, and so you have less coming out. So more damage means the curves go to the right. So I'll show you some results later, and the curves are going to go to the right with more damage, but I just want to give you a background about that. OK? But um, my student, so you and my senior PhD student, is now working on a way of the, we thought, his work, really, that we're sending waves forward and we're measuring how much energy is scattered. But what if we listen behind, send a wave forward, and see how much energy scatters back? Can that be better? That's so-called backscatter. So the idea is that we're sending a wave. It's interacting with defects. Because of that interaction, a lot of energy is scattered away and scattered back. What we have done to date that I've talked to you about is just measure the new amplitude here. But what uh, my students are doing is that, can we capture this? Maybe that's more sensitive. And um, we can detect a backscattered signal. And the answer is, it is more sensitive, much more sensitive to damage. So it does work. But it's tricky. So the idea is that normally we would send the transmitter, and then we would listen down here down the road, and then we would see the signal, and it would decay. So uh, what we're doing now is we're sending the energy and then listening on the backside. And we have to put this baffle here to, because the signals coming back are very small, so we don't want the direct acoustic wave in any way bouncing back, so we have to put this little baffle there. But the idea is we're talking forward and listening from behind, and then does that characterize the scatterer that the cracks in there in a more efficient and powerful way? And we think it does. So for example, here's a piece of uh, just a photograph of concrete that has a lot of cracks, um, real cracks in them to show you. And so what we did is that we increasingly cycle this concrete to put more damage in it. And as you see, as we put more cycles here, different kinds of cycles, hot, cold, wet, dry, that causes damage in concrete. By the way, rail ties are subjected to hot and cold cycles and wetting and drying cycles. So this is a realistic damage mechanism for concrete of any sort. Um, we see that this standard laboratory way, the best way to measure damage in concrete, shows that our cycles are definitely causing this damage to increase. So by reducing the resonant frequency, that means we're putting damage in. This is a laboratory standard method. It can only be done in the lab on a standard sample. It's not applicable in the field. We ran the test on that same sample. And here we see our backscatter coefficient is going up, kind of mirroring the same process. And this is a method that can be applied to anything in the field in a non-contact way. So I just show this to show that we have come up with a scheme that's able to kind of characterize these very small microcracks 
hopefully we're working on quantifying this, putting some meaning behind that number so that we can go back and compute the cracking. Okay. Uh, the final analysis that I'll talk about, so these are kind of introducing how we analyze all of these data, our approaches to kind of pull information out. The results I'll show you are going to be the more basic ones of velocity and attenuation uh, of the forward propagating wave because those are the ones that we've kind of are more mature and we've worked on. But if you remember this kind of delamination of the rail tie near the um, pre-stressing strand. So they corrode, they push out, and they cause this horizontal crack that runs kind of a large planar horizontal crack that runs parallel to the top of the tie. So it's as if suddenly you went from a thick element to a thin element if you imagine that this crack is so complete that now we had a thick element and now it's a thin element because of that crack. It's a plate now. Think of it as a plate. So we now have a situation where there are places where the concrete acts as a thin plate because we have a thin delamination through that. So we are trying to use these schemes to send and receive to build back these lamb wave curves, which we can do it's from geoseismics. Um, and by collecting lots of signals, we can build back these lamb wave curves. And from that, we can say whether it's a thick plate or a thin plate. Okay? So this is still ongoing work. We're excited about it. My point is that with, when you have air coupled, sensing and receiving, you can collect a lot of data. And when you can collect a lot of good data, you can do a lot of different things and use images because you have the volume and the power of the number of data. And so that's what we're trying to take advantage of here. The final thing is that we did a lot of work on, before I go into the results, we did a lot of work on the hardware because these are not off-the-shelf um, tools systems that you can buy and immediately implement. We built each component ourselves. And when I say we, I don't mean me. <laughs> I am not very good. I am not MacGyver. So um, the sensor that we use is taken from the old Polaroid camera. There used to be an old camera which had sound and it helped focus in those days when there was cameras with film in them. And uh, of course, Polaroid went out of business, but they sold that very unique, cheap uh, sensor off as its own spin-off company. And we, we can buy those. They're very inexpensive. Uh, the problem is that they just come as a kind of a speaker, a little tiny speaker. You have to provide all the hardware and circuitry and control to make them work. So it took us, uh, my students did that, and now, uh, my students are able to send in controllable frequencies and so on. But it took quite a bit of work to make that happen. <coughs> so we were able to do that, and we can have different kinds of pulses and durations and so on. So we have a lot more control about what we're sending in. And of course, the receiving, we tried a lot of different microphones, and we've settled on these MEM sensors. They are very inexpensive, and they require very little power. So when I say inexpensive, how much is one MEMS unit? Five dollars. So now we can, and we can bundle them together so that we have unique circuitry. So we don't have to have individual circuitry for each one. We can build arrays very inexpensively with low power, and so um, we have a variety of like scanning tools with our senders and receivers. So we have this little rolling robot. We have a e conventional X Y Z scanning frame, so we can move around and scan things. Um, we do a lot of 3D printing in order to make like perfect configurable baffle walls and holders and things like that that are in the right positions for us at the right angles and so on. And of course, we have to have a, a lot of signal processing, data acquisition, and all that stuff. So I just want to be very clear. This is not stuff you can go and buy from a store tomorrow and have an operating unit in one day. Um, you can buy all these things at the store. They're all cheap, but then you need to have the know-how to put it together. So our eventual goal is to have one unit that operates. But right now, we're not there. Okay. One issue uh, that we learned 
as we went along, and we got great feedback from our partners in the rail industry, is that, sure, it's great that you have um, non-contact sensors on there, but if you're going to have any hope of applying it in a moving platform, you have to have a significant standoff distance from the top of the rail. Because when you're moving along a rail, I think there is a requirement of 25 centimeters that above 25 centimeters, there should be nothing there. So it's safe. That, but anything below that, there's no guarantee there isn't something sticking up or blocking your way. So our methods, which we initially started, we had fairly close to the rail surface. That's not going to work in the real world. So our challenge is that we have to get at least eight inches off the surface. Can it still work from that high up? Because remember, we're sending in a tiny signal and then pulling out a fraction of that tiny signal. When you move away from that surface, that signal gets smaller and harder to control. So when we have close to the surface, you know, we have very, and we can control our configuration so that we have very nice, clean, high signal to noise ratios. We have a nice gap between the direct acoustic wave. We get a lot of information, very clean. And you can see the results blown up here. Very usable signals. So what if we now move higher off the rail? And uh, there are challenges to that. One of them is that now, just because of the geometry of the situation, our duration of useful signal goes down because this acoustic wave arrival comes earlier. Because the higher you are up from the surface, the sooner this direct acoustic wave will arrive after your leaky wave. It's just the reality of it. But we are still able to collect useful information. That is very usable signal-to-noise ratio for us, even at this big offset. OK, so I'm going to show just a few sets of results. These are using the most basic analysis schemes I've talked about. That's forward propagating velocity and forward propagating attenuation or energy from those curves. We are working on the backscatter and on the land wave analysis right now. And Siyun's thesis is on, so he hopes it's finished soon, too, probably. <laughs> uh, but he's doing a great job with that. OK, first, just some results from timber. In timber, what we found is that velocity, the speed, ties pretty well to the condition of the tie. So we, have, we had a limited number of timber ties that we received um, from the other side of campus. Dr. Punchal had a variety of samples, and he was kind enough to give us ones that were documented on the different levels of deterioration. And we had just a simple or sender and an array. And then if we have a series of listeners and we know the distance between them, we can draw a line and fit a line to that and figure out what the wave velocity is of that. And we can see not only the compressional wave, which is very, very tiny, but also the surface wave. So in timber, wood is a material that acoustically is closer to air than concrete is. It's softer. It has more air in it. We can get more energy into that. And therefore, we can actually see the P wave, which we can't see in concrete. So we have both P wave and surface wave very cleanly. We can measure that. And we see that when the material deteriorates, so we have a good case and a bad case, as expected, the velocities decrease accordingly. So, um, and again, clean, useful information. So first of all, velocity can be used to monitor timber degradation. Now, if I, if I give you a velocity value, it doesn't mean you can now use that and say, oh, the residual strength of this tie is blank. And the reason is that we have a wide variety of timber species. This happens probably, this metric would work with a kind of single species of timber tie. But if you had different species with different densities and grain structures and knots and so on, now using unique number for velocity becomes much more difficult and non-unique. So that's an issue with timber. It's a highly variable material. Um, OK, in the remaining time, I'll tell, show some results that we did for to kind of quantify. In this case, I'm just showing rail seat deterioration, one focus study. And so again, um, we're looking at this kind of wearing away erosion, hydraulic 
fracturing beneath the rail pad and the tie, which occurs, I think, under saturated conditions and extremely high dynamic loads and other kinds of situations. Um, and so we kind of see if we can characterize that. Um, and here, just kind of a picture for those of you who are not familiar, which are probably none, that the mechanism manifests itself not as distributed in microcracking, but kind of like a roughness, an undulation, where you have a layer that's eroded away, and what's left is this kind of rough, undulated surface. So we're trying to detect a rough, undulated surface with waves. That's a kind of a tall order. And another tall order is that that occurs beneath a rail, and between the rail and the rail uh, tie is a pad, a polymer pad. So this is a complicated structure, which probably causes a whole host of problems. So there's a picture of the pad in the rail seat that we have to fight through if we want to do this in place. So our preliminary tests, we would just wanted to see, regardless of the standoff distance, we said, OK, let's start with unreasonable standoff just to see if we can see some differences. So recognize that these are quite close to the surface, right? well below the eight inches or six inches or whatever that's 250 that's required. And basically, we just sent waves across this interface. And here you see our 3D scanner, which we can use to send and receive the waves. And the path, you can see we went here and here. Um, it's harder to go this way because you have these uh, kind of metal bracket seats, which kind of reflect a lot of information. So we go with this kind of diagonal direction for now. And we had three different um, cases of RSD, which were given us to us by Railtech, our friends at Railtech. Um, so we're grateful for that. And uh, so the first issue is, does this pad make a difference, or does it kill everything? So does the pad get rid of our ability to detect any sort of undulation damage? So we have two cases, the same RSD without pad and with pad and rail. So in one case, for moderate RSD damage, we tried it with pad and no pad. And before we did this test, I thought that when the pad is in place, that is going to suck up all the energy, and we're not going to get ener any energy through. But what was very interesting is that not only did we not lose energy, we actually lost less energy because of the pad, which is a very surprising result. We still can't really explain why that is. It's a pretty consistent result. It may have to do something with an interface wave or the way it's bound, the way that the wave gets bound in that interface. But the bottom line is we're not losing energy because of that pad. And uh, the same thing happened in, the, uh, in all the cases. So this is the more serious um, level of RSD or not. So we are able to kind of get information through even that. Pad. Oh, yeah. Did you uh, do any study of we had the samples that we got from Railtech. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would be a very good um, problem to solve maybe with finite element, where you can, like, parametrically change the pad modulus and then run the propagation through. We can do that. Um, we experimentally, we were given three rails and one pad. So I don't know about the other kinds of pads, or as the pads deteriorate, they probably oxidize, and they probably stiffen and, and brittle. So I don't know how that changes, to be honest with you. Thank you. It's got to be some kind of wave guide effect, right? You're capturing I'm more guessing. energy under the pad. Right. It's actually shuttling more energy through, interestingly. Um, but yeah, I mean, for instance, I don't know about the different kinds of pads that we have in the field. And maybe some pads, if they're soft, or viscoelastic kind, they would actually suck up the energy probably more. OK, so um, remember that moving integrate. So we now um, we found that velocity doesn't change very much. So it's not a very sensitive tool. But can we use the energy? And so again, we're using this moving window and getting this kind of envelope of the energy, uh, which you can see from these curves. They kind of look like these curves, which are people use diffusion curves to kind of model that and put a number to it. So we have the three different, I just put the pictures here to 
mind you, there are three different levels of RSD. R3 is the worst. R1 is the best, meaning least. And you can see, as we expected, that the more damage that's in there, we have this curve slightly moving to the right. Again, this is with the forward propagating waves. Um, so we do get some sensitivity to that. Um, it's not a tremendous amount of separation uh, amid the noise. So we, we separate these curves, but in some places it's not a clear distinction. It's not enough for us to give confidence. Backscatter, maybe we can find that difference. Uh, another question is that, you know, how repeatable are these data? We collect them along uh, one scan across um, an RSD area. But, you know, are they consistent on this rough surface and can we count on them to characterize that is a signal set? Can we count on them to characterize? So what we did is we took 10 sets of signals. Each one we repeated seven times, so a total of seven signals, just to see, you know, if we go back to the same thing, do we get about the same numbers? And if we go on different levels of RSD, do we see a distinction between the two? And uh, so basically what we're plotting is shown here in these box plots. So a box plot is kind of a, a statistical way to neatly visualize data. And so in each one of these box lines are seven data, and that represents seven data. And the top and the bottom bars represent the outliers, and the blue box represents 75% of the data statistically are held within the blue box, and the red line is the median. So you can see along the same position, or the same level of RSD, but in different positions. So this is all, I forgot which level of RSD this was. But we have, of course, variation. But the boxes are lining up with each other. So statistically, they're quite equivalent. So it gives us confidence okay, um, that we have a kind of a usable metric that we can have some confidence will be the same, characterizing the same condition. Now let's see if we compare using the same scale along the different levels of RSD. And oops, sorry. I just show here um, the different levels. And here, uh, this is smooth, and this is the worst case. So we see a clear distinction between no damage and damage statistically. The boxes are separated. So remember, this is the same scale here and here so that they're plotted all along. And we can see a clear distinction. Aha, the energy that we measure is lower here because of the scattering than here. But the moderate case of RSD, we have both in the range of good and in the range of bad. So we, I was expecting that we, we would have three horizontal lines, one high, one medium, and one low. We did have that for the extreme cases, but in the intermediate cases, it looked like we have some regions that are bad and some regions that are good. So we couldn't say whether it's definitely good or bad, but we could say that not all of it is good. So in a way, we are saying that it's intermediate. And I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up kind of quickly now. The next step is to say, OK, it looks like we have a way to characterize RSD. Now can we do it with a meaningful offset, large offset? And again, we have different levels of RSD. And uh, so here, oh, shoot, sorry, wrong button. So here we now have the large offset. And what we're doing is because we have this large offset and we have a large distance, we don't have the luxury of kind of crossing here at good access that we had before. We kind of have to go through these uh, the end collars uh, for the rail seat um, because if we have that large offset and we want to maintain that. So basically what we have here is that we have, what you'll see here is one sender here, and then we have different receiver sets to see the, if the path uh, makes a difference. And as you can imagine, path one, the path that does not interact with those steel collars at the end of the rail seat, that has the most usable large signals because these act to reflect energy quite a bit because they extend into the surface, and the surface waves are kind of reflected from that. We can still get information. It's not as useful however. But here you see from path one, which skims right alongside the end of that uh, rail collar, rail seat collar, 
we see the three cases, solid, rough one, and rough two. So you can see the increasing damage follows that diffusive trend. And again, I want, it's not real diffusion, it's not heat diffusion or material diffusion. They use diffusive equations to fit these lines, and they, from that, they pull a diffusion coefficient, which they relate to damage. It has nothing to do with actual diffusion. And that confuses a lot of people, and that's why I want to spend some time. But when we fit the lines, we can now quantify this difference and have one diffusion coefficient for this level of damage and this one, and they are distinct from each other. Okay, so um, future work. Where are we? So I'm kind of giving you a picture of where we are today. Where do we go now? Well, the first thing is that I want to optimize the data evaluation. I want to try to use backscatter more. I think that's more powerful. And we want to implement this lamb wave thing for a totally different problem. That's not for RSD. That's only for the um, delamination due to the tendon corrosion. Then, at, and not on... I don't want to wait till this is done. I want to start trying to implement this in the field. I think we've gone about as far as we can in the lab with our limited samples. And they are limited samples. They, we only have a number of, a few of them. They're not in the real environment. They're not in place embedded. We don't have ambient noise. I think now's the time we need to go out there and put these, try it on real in situ rail where we know this one is bad and this one is good and this one has this damage and so on and see where we are and at the same time kind of improve uh, what we're doing. So um, that's what I would like to do. I want to acknowledge our funding for this in part came from the uh, Association of American Railroads through the tech scanning program, which is run through Railtech. Very grateful for them to give us the opportunity to do this work. Otherwise, it would be much harder to make progress on this, um, which I think we've done, and I'm kind of happy to report to you about. And so thanks also for your attention. We've got a few minutes, uh, maybe one or two questions. Anybody? Yes. Um, first of all, let me say, I've, I've done a lot of medical ultrasound work. Um, okay. But if you describe this to me without showing me the results, I would say this is never going to work. Air okay. coupling, right. not going to get enough signal. I'm dumbfounded by the amount of apparently useful information you're able to get yeah. just out of velocity and amplitude. And I'm especially surprised at the degree to which it seems to correlate with the deterioration. Right. You know, even the fact that you can pick up the signal, I think, is impressive, let alone the fact that yeah. it seems Thank to you. be yeah. useful. Uh, I'm dumbfounded, too. A couple of comments and a question. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a compliment. A couple of comments and a question. Um, seems like you can probably deal with the ambient noise by yeah. just subtracting the input yeah. from the ambient microphone to some noise, can active noise cancellation. Right. I'm wondering, I, just, if I would be curious over time to see when you're out in the field the extent to which moisture content has an effect, because I would say wet yep. concrete is a completely different material than yep. particularly the dry concrete. That's right. The question I had was, You've seen, uh, you're, all through this, I'm thinking that you're basically making the case for the fact that the, these simple factors, this propagation speed and the amplitude, mm -hmm. is indicative of sort of the, perhaps the entire condition of this track structure. And of course, right. the interesting thing here is how, uh, how sound is the track structure is viewed by the track. Yeah. I'm wondering. You mean you as a use, whole. I'm wondering why you don't use yeah. the rails as your transducers since they're essentially already in contact with the track. And you apply the signal to one, one rail and listen on the other rail. Oh, you mean across the, the rail, um, rail through yeah. the track structure. Have you um, looked at that at all, or do you feel like the advantages of the, of the air coupling are, are better? It seems like you get a lot more signal, and maybe if you measure more of the overall track. Well, track um, track you probably know that there are transducers that are on wheels, that are on the rail, that could very well do that if you are on either side, and you synchronize them, and you send the energy. And then you are getting a much more global, holistic picture of the infrastructure, not just the rail, but the rail head, and the fastening system, and the pad, and the rail, and maybe even the ballast, and how it's absorbing things. So I think you're absolutely right. It's a great idea. People do it. Um, I'm aware of one research group in England that kind of does this through rail. Um, I don't think they go across, but they go down, like um, one rail to another, because they're more interested in, in the rail, in the rail well, that's part. What I I've never thought of using that. I never. Yeah, going across. There was a measurable ultrasonic effect 
that right. correlate with the high quality? Yeah, I mean, so I think your idea is a really good one. The reason we didn't do that, aside from I didn't think of that idea, <laughs> is that um, you know when we were um, this was supported by AAR and they were interested in the tie, yeah. not in the whole system. I think really everyone's interested in the whole system, but you know we kind of took the attack of what's going on with the tie. Well, an exciting aspect of this is your sensors are so cheap right. that you could envision an array that could not only yes. determine, you know, could determine where the flaw, where the flaw is in the tie, in addition right. to whether there's a flaw. Exactly. I mean, because we have the ability to collect a lot of data and make a lot of sensors in an array, because I mean they all work and can communicate, um, is that you can get a lot of information and then localize and characterize. That's kind of my dream of solving all the problems with one sensor set. But you know, sending from one rail to another across the tie, and now you're in physical contact with a wheel sensor, it makes a lot of sense. So, any I'll to write a proposal. Any other questions? <laughs> Do we have any online or not? No? OK. Well, to conclude, um, as a small token of our appreciation. Ah, thank you. Is it filled with coffee? No. <laughs> <laughs> the much coveted Railtech mug. Thank you. Okay. This is a numbered series, <laughs> uh, number 15. Like Eight six four two seven one three. <laughs> There's only a few so in existence. Meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much. I Thank appreciate you again, the opportunity. Professor Bob. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Thanks.